Okay, he stole my transition about why I'm up here. Um, it turns out that in informatics, it's a study not only of the user-centered design and the tools that we're all going to need, but also a study of the people behavior once you have the tools or what kinds of constellations of tools you need. And we've been focusing a lot on long-distance work, and most of software engineering is long-distance work. But before I get into the talk, let me just show you a bit. I don't know why it keeps saying yeah, wait a moment over there, and it doesn't, so I'm going to tap here because I don't want to wait a moment. Um, just like Andre said, this is a research group that's been doing this work. It's a large research group. Yes, my partner, husband, and collaborators up on the right, we are the Olsons. Uh, and sometimes it's very funny, people will call us up and say, we need Ann Olson on this particular panel. You guys work it out of who's going to come. It's a strange position. Anyway, it's a large group of people, and we're funded both by the uh, National Science Foundation and Google and Army Research. Everybody seems to be interested in working together apart, because you have to work together, and yet you are not in the same location. So it's also the Donald Brennan Foundation. I have a uh, endowed chair. What that means, it's not only the name, but I get a research fund every year that, again, I spend on this particular uh, uh, project. You go. Jeep, keep going. OK. Good. All right, I want to hands here. How many of you work with somebody who's not in the same building? Yeah. Or you will. <laughs> All right. Is it going well? Uh, it's hard, right? You have little bruises around the edge. All right. It's even getting harder because there's new, newer technologies, and we're not quite sure how to use them. I've been uh, talking to a lot of people who are using the cloud and Google Drive and whatever other repositories we have out there. And I can't remember, for example, where I put things. Or if it's this group, is this a Dropbox group or is this a Google Drive group? And you know, spending 20 minutes looking for it. So we call it thunder in the cloud. All right? There's a lot of confusion out there. But there's also all kinds of exciting technologies. How many of you use Hangout or Skype? With more than one person? No. Sometimes, OK, good. Sharing your desktop? Fabulous. All right. We have lots of devices even in classrooms. And what's interesting in classrooms these days is when I'm up there lecturing or giving people exercises to do, they can do the exercises there, but then they also have a back channel chat going about whether they like what I'm talking about or you know they're, they're looking up things that are useful for class, I'm sure. I have seen a few YouTubes. Um, and also exciting things like telemedicine. So this is a telemedicine robot, so the physician typically an expert in a, in a smaller area that is not available everywhere, is on a robot. He, quote, hops on the robot and can move himself around the ER or doing rounds and things like that. There's all kinds of interesting technology issues there about security, but also really interesting issues about the social interaction between the person who is physically there and the physician. <clears throat> so what I want to talk about today is what's hard about working together apart. I want to talk about the progress we are making, because this study that we've been working on, we've been doing for over 20 years, and certainly the technology and the people have changed during that time. So I'm going to talk about the framework of what's hard, and then I'm going to say what kinds of progress we've been making. And then the last thing I want to do is uh, offer to you something called the Collaboration Success Wizard, which is an online resource where you can assess whether your team is doing what, everything it can in order to work well if you are long distance. So I'll, I'll show you about that as well. All right, why do I get to be up here talking about this stuff? Well, as I said, we've been working on this field for over 20 years. We've been mainly looking at what are called collaboratories. So lots of big science and engineering these days is done across various universities and sometimes across universities and industry. And so, of course, they're all distributed and they're having a hard time. A lot of your tax dollars go to supporting these collaboratories and about half of them work. And you go, what's up with the other half? Well, we could have been in there helping them because a lot of the things are not technical, they're social about how the things are running. Uh, there's a lot of literature about that, about all of this stuff. Um, we've done a meta-analysis of what makes for success, which is leading to the collaboration success wizard. We also know that these collaboratories are not, you know, the way all work goes. We've actually done a lot of interviews of people in industry, some people actually at IBM. Um, and you can imagine that even working together in part when you're a small organization is very different from when you're an IBM. Right? There are lots of resources, a lot of structure, all kinds of things, much more agile if you're small. But still, there are issues uh, common to all of these settings about what makes it easy to work. So in what I want to talk about, oh, sorry, culminating in there's two books. 
I'm going to tell you about one is called Scientific Collaboration on the Internet. It was published in 2000, uh, 2008. And it has the theory in it, but it also has a lot of good case examples. So we give the theory and then say, here's what this organization did, what worked and what didn't, and why we know that this is a hard thing to do. So there's, there's some good cases there. And then just 2014, just in March this year, we published Working Together Apart. Um, and it's a book that's ex intended to be very accessible. So it's 125 pages. It's got both the, uh, the theory in it and then practical examples about how you can actually do a better job when you're working together apart. Okay, so these are the factors. But what I want you to do when I talk about these things is imagine your own case. So your project that you're working on where people were not in the same location. All right, and as we go through this, see whether it's a checklist, basically for you. What could I have done better? Did I get this one right? Things like that. So think about your own personal example. So the nature of the work. Many organizations try to do everything long distance. Whatever it is, we're just gonna, you know, we're gonna tough it out and do it long distance. Well, you should think very carefully about this because the more partitionable the work is, if it's you're doing the database and they're doing the interface, and yes, there has to be communication, but not as much as if you're all doing the database. All right, so partition the work for locations. In fact, one of our key examples had to do with finance, uh, financial reporting at the end of the month at IBM, where they tried to do things that was all connected across all locations around the world. In the end, they had to keep it partitioned so that they had fewer need to do the long distance communication. All right, common ground, this is a big one. If you're gonna work with people long distance, often you're, uh, hmm, they are the people you need in a different expertise than you and you don't speak the same language. So UX people with developers, developers with QA, um, lawyers with anybody, all right? you don't speak the same language. All right, so um, mutual beliefs and knowledge and assumptions, both about how you do the work and then what the vocabularies are. We did some observations at, uh, used to be at, called Anderson Consulting. And it turned out after about an hour, it was clear that people were using the word system very differently. We all think we know what system, and the question is what does system include? Is it just in the box? Is it the whole, is it with the person and with the whole organization, et cetera? So it was clear that, and Anderson has an interesting to solution to this. They said, right, for every one of our teams, we're gonna put a brand new person in there called a green bean, that was an official title, I'm a green bean in the group, uh, who was supposed to ask the naive questions. And it turned out the naive questions were very helpful in the people getting to have common ground. So the green bean said, wait a minute, what do you mean by system? And then suddenly people could collaborate. So mutual knowledge, people have worked together before, have worked all these things out, so continuing to work with the same people long distance turns out to be a good win common vocabulary, but also common management and working style. So if you are in a hierarchical organization, and then you're, you have your software developers doing agile, there's a mismatch in the working style about expectations, documentation, you know, forward planning, all kinds of things like that. So um, often when you're working with people long distance, they've come from some other working style, and you have to work out, well, what are our expectations? You have to actually talk about it, right? How are we gonna actually get our work done? I've noticed that here, just working with people in different disciplines. So somebody in sociology, they don't write conference papers. We have a CHI deadline, that's called, in, in September, and everybody knows what that is, and we're all gonna write our conference papers. Conference papers count. Um, but when I talk to a sociologist, it turns out they write books, and it'll be three years. And so they're much, they do bigger projects, but they sort of take a longer time to come out with conclusions. Very frustrating for me to work with somebody like that, and they think, since I'm always producing something once a year, that I'm very shallow. Right? So it's a mismatch there. Didn't go so well. All right, collaboration readiness is another one. I think the bottom line is, is there something in it for everybody? Right? Are you rewarded? Many times, I'm a user experience person, and many times I'm asked to be on a software development team so I can do the user interface. But I'm a researcher in, in user interface development, and I want to get publications. So I'm going to do something really weird and jazzy, and they just want development interface, right? So we have to get the expectations right. They should they should find somebody as a UX developer, not a researcher. And we've had the same thing happen when we have computer science researchers on a development team. 
They just want to get the publications out, not have hardened code. Right. So you have to get your ex get the make sure that the motivations are, are right. Mix of skills are uh, greater productivity. You like working together. Something in it for everyone, not a mandate from above. Because if you don't want to do this thing, even if you're going to be paid to do it, it depends on how much of yourself you put into the job. Right? If you have, if there's some other motivation, typically these are fun people to work with, and look the cool thing we get to do. Trust is a big one, all right? When you are long distance, you don't see each other. And you don't run into each other in the coffee room or anything like that. You don't talk about anything except work. And so I don't know whether you're reliable or not. And sometimes I send you an email and you get it and you read and say, well, I can't do that now, that's too much. And I never hear back from you for a long time. Well, I think, I don't know, you don't care or you don't like me, all right? So there's this whole thing about attributing bad motivations to people who are long distance that you wouldn't do if they were in the same building with you, if you ran into them. So what does this say about email? I send you a long email of things I want you to do. What should you do? Got it. I'll get to it on Thursday. right? And so that builds up trust. There are lots of little react to me things. We also recommend that for especially long distance uh, Skypes or Hangouts, start talking about something social, like you would if you're walking into this room. How's it going? What's the weather like there? Did you, have, did you see that soccer game last night? Whatever, to do the social stuff so these things, people seem like real people, as opposed to just the worker bees that you're working with. Have your goals aligned? There's a whole phenomenon called group self-efficacy. It comes from the individual self-efficacy. If you think you can do it in spite of various kinds of uh, uh, barriers, you as a group can build this we can do it attitude independent of what's going to what obstacles are going to come in our way and again it's part of the trust building the personalization of you know who's in a group all right there's a lot of management planning and decision making most of these things are uh, relevant if you're not in an IBM so if you're in a scientific collaboration right there's typically nobody who steps up to be the quote project manager the day by day project manager We'd rather spend the money on another scientist than on this sort of organizational person. So if it's a loose collaboration, you have to make sure that somebody's in charge, right? That there's a manager who understands the whole project, has goals, checks up on people, things like that. So in scientific collaboration, it's really important to get somebody to step up to that particular role. Otherwise, it falls apart. People at different locations will do different things and drift apart. They take the money and run. Um, if you're distributed, how many of you have people you're working with that are more than two time zones away? More than three? Yeah, more than four. <laughs> Outside your work day? Yeah, okay, <laughs> tough stuff, right? Those don't go away. I actually have to be on an examining committee in, uh, next week for somebody in Toronto, and they set it at 10 in the morning, Toronto time, and I'm going, oh, no. You know, so I gotta, I'll be in my pajamas or something with my cup of coffee at 7 a.m. Uh, to be on this particular conference call. Um, I, who is it? I think somebody in the back said that they, last time they had to do something like this, they had their pajama bottoms on but had a regular top on. <laughs> so they really don't stand up. All right. So dealing with really long time zones is really hard. So what do you do? Wait late in the evening? Early in the morning? Both. Both? Is it with Japan? Is it with Japan? Yeah, Europe. so 12, 13 time zones away? Yes. Yeah, and it's really hardest when you have somebody from Europe, the US, and uh, the Pacific Rim. All right, somebody's really, you know, not at their best, <laughs> we'll say. So a lot of accommodation having to do that. That's not gonna go away, but recognizing that, make sure it's fair for everybody. So whoever's inconvenience is not always the same person uh, that you sort of pass around that, that particular um, hindrance. Uh, it's important that there's a critical mass at each location. If there's a singleton, we had a number of cases where somebody had to, software developer, had to move. They moved to North Carolina, everybody else was in Denver, so it's a single satellite person. Well, they would forget about her occasionally. Oh yeah, we're supposed to send that to Karen. Um, when she had technical difficulties, there was no tech support around. She had to go to, I don't know, Costco or you know someplace to go get her computer fixed. So there were all kinds of issues about you know, having a critical mass at each location so that you've got compatriots in your own place 
and people remember about you. Uh, having a management plan, project manager is respected, communication plan, that's important. And I do this now since I know it's a place that a lot of us fail, is when you have a new collaboration, so write down how you're going to communicate. So are we going to use Skype every Friday at some convenient time? Are we going to use Drive or are we going to use whatever? Um, uh, am I available by phone? How often will I answer email? Should I be on text? All right, let's just talk about how we're going to do our communication because every collaboration is different. At IBM, you have a set of tools you can choose from, right? Isn't there a great big repository? In fact, collaboration tools? Mm -hmm. You gotta talk about it at the beginning. How are we gonna do this particular, you know, are we gonna set up a blog? Sometimes blogs are good, sometimes not, right? But talk as a group about what your success is gonna be. Um, also plan for room, a room for reflection and redirection. Uh, if you cross organizations, if you go IBM to some other like startup, there's gonna be a lot of legal issues. In scientific collaboration, there are a lot of legal issues because you cross university boundaries and somebody wants the intellectual property. Right? Who owns this cool thing that we're going to, buy, we're going to develop? Um, decision making is free of favoritism, fair and open. Everybody has an opportunity to influence. It doesn't mean it's democratic. We want the people who really know stuff to make the decisions, but everybody should be heard because there may be some gotchas along the way that somebody knows about that, that the manager does not. All right, technical readiness. Uh, as we move on, we are more and more technically ready. All right, we've got everybody's got their laptops and their text and things like that. Uh, we want to make sure that whatever collaboration has the suite of tools that they need. That's part of this communication covenant. Um, it's not just how we're going to communicate, but what technologies we're going to use. Important to talk about communication, both synchronous and asynchronous. You know these these speaker phones that they're called half duplex. So when I'm speaking, a lot of cell phones are this. When I'm speaking, I can't hear you go, uh-huh, uh-huh, right? Or if I hear you, then you can't hear me. All right, it's just one way, the whole thing. Really bad for human communication. It, because as I talk, when I hear you say, uh-huh, uh-huh, I can say, she gets it, right? I can move on. Turns out if you don't hear the uh-huh, uh-huh, you will talk longer. And the other person can't get in, right? unless they're really loud. Uh, and they'll take the channel. So really looking at the, the human aspects of all these technologies that you're adopting. So communication, coordination, so sharing calendars or not, uh, repositories, and then infrastructure. Infrastructure being are we going to use the cloud or not? What kinds of security issues do we have? We're we doing medical applications, et cetera. What kinds of uh, HIPAA requirements are there? And you know, are we secure or not? So all kinds of issues like that arise. Uh, I can skip through this. So a summary, the nature of the work, common ground, collaboration readiness, this management stuff, and then technical readiness. Do you have the tools that you need? Uh, but we've made progress. Many, many organizations are realizing that they have to do something about knowledge management. If, uh, even informal organizations will have like meeting minutes, and then somebody, and where did they go? You know, and, and it, oh, we did that earlier, and we, know, we, we have to figure out how to manage all of that. Sites like these, Google Docs, Dropbox. There's awareness support we have about who's doing what right now, both in terms of the project, but also who's in. So actually looking at somebody's calendar and realizing that they're at a conference this weekend in Paris, they're probably traveling on Friday, so I shouldn't expect anything back from them. So it's just awareness of who's around, et cetera. We used to look at uh, the dean's calendar, not yours, but another dean, um, to see when he was in town so we could ambush him because we needed a signature. So there'd be this little line of people outside the door. We know, you know, here he's coming. Um, so this coordinate awareness support. Or project management. Um, we are now teaching our undergraduates project management so they know what a Gantt chart is. And I love teaching, oh, I'll probably offend somebody here now. 20-year-olds uh, who, for the first time, I get them to do a Gantt chart of their quarter about when are all the assignments due. And, and they say, oh my god, March 4th is going to be a really bad day. This little light bulb goes off. I could look ahead. I could do something early, you know. Oh, oh my God, change the world. Um, anyway, Gantt charts project management. More people are aware there are these kinds of tools. A lot of organizations know that for any project, you should have a face-to-face -face kickoff meeting. That's where a lot of trust and communication is built up. Very important. There's incentives. There's trust-building activities. Any of you done any of these? Were you read? Yeah. Okay. 
Yeah, so you have to lean back and hope that somebody <laughs> catches you. <laughs> well, I thought he was going to do it. Um, there's a lot of books out there um, about virtual teams. There's recognition of people who are good leaders at this. Uh, we know that social interaction builds trust. We know a lot of things now. Uh, common ground, there's more awareness of it. I want to just give a plug for something called GlobeSmart. It is an assessment tool where they say, well, who's on your team? Are they from different cultures? Could be even within the United States. It's an individual thing. You say, in these 19 situations, what would you do? Right? So it's not a Likert scale and stuff. Like, what would you do? And then it assesses you and it says, all right, here's the other people in your group and how they line up. Turns out that you're a risk taker and these other three are not. All right? And then they show you example videos of that kind of mismatch and how it can go wrong. And as you look at it, you get really uncomfortable. Right? So it means that we should talk about, I'm a risk taker and you're not. Where are the situations where we ought to accede to the non-risky situations and where can we take a risk to the test. Basically, talk about GlobeSmart is really great. They've got over 600,000 people have taken this, so they've got the data, right? So they don't just say, what's the profile for Chinese? Well, Chinese are very different, right, individually. Um, it is these people, we can do the one for in general, what is it like to work with somebody from China, um, but, you know, it's mainly who are the individuals in your group and where are the differences going to come from. So that's a plug for GlobeSmart. Time zones we've already talked about. There are, you can talk about how we're actually going to handle this and make sure it's fair for everybody. There are a number of asynchronous tools where if you're working close, you know, around the globe, where they formally, when you're finished with your day, you actually write a report of what you've done so the next people can read it and pick it up. Right? Uh, around the world software development is no faster than co-located just work through your eight hours a day because of the coordination issues. Turns out everybody's working 24 hours, but not necessarily well. All right, it's really hard. There are lots of people talking about distance matters, uh, that it still matters. Um, what I'd like to do is offer to you then this, what's called the Collaboration Success Wizard. Uh, it is, uh, we take the theory and make it into a questionnaire, like a survey. It's got about 35 questions on it, asking you whether you do certain kinds of activities or whether they are important to the kind of work that you're doing. You fill it in and then you push a little button and you get a little report about where in your collaboration from your viewpoint things are going well, where it's strong, and where it's weak and what you could do about it. So it's actually prescriptive. Um, we like to do this for a whole group. Everybody in your group do this because then we get all the data and it's, I, we can then write a report saying, well, people in India feel this way and the people in uh, Redmond feel this way. Right, so somebody ought to do something about it, right, about this divide. So we get the whole thing. That's what it looks like. There's a little outline on the left-hand side about where are you in the whole thing, and then the questions are like this. This is, to what extent do you think your particular um, collaboration members are naturally collaborative, or are they competitive? There are a lot of financial organizations where your individual performance is rewarded and not your group, and so people don't give their best ideas to others. Right, so other kinds of people are really collaborative. The three versions of it, the future, like you're about to embark on something, and so you know, do you have everything in place? Uh, the present is sort of to do reflection. Right, where are we? What else could we be doing to make it better? And then we have the past tense, which we're really interested in because we want to know whether things succeeded or failed. Um, in some cases, you want to say, well, last time we did this, let's look at it. And so we can, again, do the right things going forward. Um, we've tested it on over 190 individuals so far. Uh, there's a URL. One moment. Okay. There will be a URL. <laughs> um, so what you do is apply. There's a website. It looks like the thing on the right-hand side. Tell us the project you're working on just to make sure this fits, what kind of things we can help you with. Give the project names and the list of people's emails if we want to go forward. We send out the request, but we often send it out over an important person's name. So it would come from Dean Stern, saying, we really want you to do this. And everybody goes, oh, OK, I'll throw this out. Um, and then we monitor the responses and send out reminders and then close it and do the analysis. Um, it, as I say, each person gets an individual report. We really spend a lot of time on that report. So that it doesn't sound like some impersonal computer output. 
you know, you said yes on this, you said no on that. It's actually paragraphs and summaries and things like that. Um, this is a win-win. You get the actual advice and we get the data. So there is the URL, hana.ics.uci.edu slash wizard. Thank you. For a question. Uh, I can put in a plug. I took the wizard as part of uh, um, oh, BURN, the NIH yes. funded BURN, which was a uh, biomedical informatic resource network, a brain imaging project that had about eight universities across the US and Canada uh, working together. And it, and it is interesting <coughs> because things. Um, sometimes when I hear you know a presentation like this, you say, "Gee, boy, a lot of this sounds like common sense." But I had a colleague who said, "You know, the thing about common sense is it's not all that common." <laughs> it's and, not all that common. And, and you forget about you know how important like different technologies are and yeah, to, to make, make sure, sure that people that was a, a that turned out to be an important issue for us. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. Um, the data that you collect using the wizard. Uh, yeah. Uh, how open is that data, or how anonymized is it? It is. Uh, we have to know names in order to put people in the right place in the organization, but then the names are erased. Okay. Right. So it is anonymous. We never publish people's names or the name of the organization. Good. Thank you very much. Anything else?